All right. Good Shabbos, everybody. Shabbos. And also a Chodesh Tov. Yesterday was a new month. We started a new month, the month of Kislev, which, of course, is the month of miracles. And my wish for all of you is that you guys will experience miracles this month. Please, may it be so. We could all do with a miracle, right? But in saying that, though, when we view miracles and when we look for miracles, I think sometimes we, we overshoot it. We, if we expect God to split the sea for us, or to send food falling from the sky for us, we think that is the only type of miracle that's constituted in this world. But I think another blessing I want to give to you guys for this month is rather that you would recognize the miracles that are already in front of you. Because very often we don't see them. We are blinded by the light, you can say that of everyday life. And we don't realize that every single day is an absolute miracle. If you see yourself in the mirror, in the mirror and the, tomorrow morning or this afternoon when you get home, remind yourself that you are a miracle. The odds of you being born were heavily against you ever coming into this world, yet you are here. It's an amazing thing to think about how many miracles there are on a daily basis that we don't recognize. Never mind the fact of you being born, but making it to the age you are now, through all the challenges, surviving all the situations of danger in the past, being alive in a worldwide pandemic, we are witnessing miracles day in and day, in and day out. We just need to make sure that we are not blinded by the everyday common things so that we don't see the hand of God in our lives. And since we're talking about being blinded, I want to talk about this week's parasha, where we see old Isaac, Yitzchak, our father, Yitzchak Avinu, who of course, this week's parasha tells us, grows up to an old age and eventually turns blind. And while he's blind, he decides, okay, my end is coming near. I have to give a blessing to my sons. You know, from the Torah, it tells us, and tradition as well, that your firstborn son is supposed to get the bigger blessing, right? So he calls his sons for the blessings. What, what happens over there? We've got the big switcheroo where old Jacob, uh, his mother, Rivka, tells him to get dressed in the clothes of Esau, go and take the blessing. So Jacob comes in to the room where Isaac's about to bless him, dressed in his brother's finest regalia, right? And what happens? Yitzchak says, the voice is the voice of Yaakov, but the hands are the hands of Esau. And I think there's a valuable lesson for us, us religious folk, those of us who are here at school today, to consider ourselves religious and try to be pious. There's a lesson for us in this very verse. Because I came across a commentary from the Dubno Magid this week, where he said this verse perfectly personifies majority of us religious people. We have the voice of Yaakov, but we have the hands of Esau. What does he mean? He says, the voice of Yaakov, this means we pray. We come to shul on Shabbos. We do our prayers at home. We study the Torah in our free time. Wednesday nights we're on Zoom studying the Gospels, right? We conform to all the halakha that our sages have set for, out for us and how to keep the commandments. But we still have Esau's hands when it comes to our actions. We all talk. No action. In our actions, many times, regardless of how much we pray, how much we study, we make mistakes left, right, and center. And we are more like Esau than we are like Jacob when it comes to our actions. And let's be honest. Every single one of us, to some degree, we are concerned about our appearance, about the facade that we put up for people around us to look at and how they judge us and what they think of us, right? Otherwise, you wouldn't have combed your hair before you came here this morning. Otherwise, you wouldn't have worn your nicest, nicest shoes or your nicest clothes to come here on Shabbos. We are all worried about our appearance on the outside. Sometimes more than we are concerned about our appearance on the inside. For example, this week, since it's Parashat Dot, and we read about Esau wanting some of that red, red stuff, I caught myself twice this week having to change my outfit. You know what it's like in the morning when you wake up, get dressed, eat your food, and then only after you've done all that for half an hour, then only you wake up and realize you've eaten cardboard and you got dressed in the wrong clothes, et cetera, et cetera. This week, twice it happened to me that I got dressed, and as I was about to climb in the car, I realized I was dressed fully in red. You can't do that in this week's parasha with Esau being Mr. Red Red himself. So I had to go back and change twice this week. I was very concerned. Similarly with Judah this week, we tried to send him to school with his keeper. And every morning we'd put, it looks like there's more clips in his hair than keeper itself. We try and make the thing stick there so he doesn't take it off. But as soon as he gets to school, off goes the keeper. By the end of this week, the teacher gave us a whole pack of keepers that Judah just threw on the ground for the week that she's been collecting. But he just doesn't want to wear. But I want my kid to wear it. I want to be a religious to understand it, right? 
And we try and do this. We write about our appearance. Last week, I spoke about Rebecca. Remember in the, in the story of the Torah, Rivka got all that jewelry from Eliezer. I asked Rebecca this week, if she doesn't want to try wearing a nose ring. So that maybe I can, you know, put a string in it and walk her around like a camel. That didn't go off well. She told me, no, Sydney, you can hold my hand. It's a miracle. It's the month of miracles. <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> month of miracles. I was very clever, though. I stood the other side of the table when I said it. <laughs> so I came across a very, very interesting story this week from a rabbi that's got one of these YouTube channels, a rabbi in Israel called Rabbi Yaakov Sinclair. I don't know if any of you know him, but there's really cool inspirational things each week. Uh, and he put up a video on this week's parasha last year uh, about the same idea of how, how we view our appearances versus why we have appearances. Um, and I want to share this with you guys. He tells a story of a family, true story, of a family that lives there in Jerusalem. And um, every Friday night, they would invite people that are there at the hotel at the Western Wall who don't have a place to eat on Friday night. They would invite them to their home. So every Friday night, their home is packed with about 50, 60 people that they feed a Friday night Shabbos dinner. Every Friday night of their lives, they do this. Amazing family, right? Now, there's one Friday night when they had uh, all these guests over. There was a university student that, was, that came to study there in Jerusalem that decided to take up this offer. Free meal, why not, right? But this university student was agnostic, non-religious, didn't want to know anything about religion. And the whole night long, while the father of this house tried to share with them words of Torah, this university student would interrupt and say, that's not possible. That's a lie. Prove it. This is just blind faith. And he was chiding this guy all night long, irritating this guy, but no, still got to feed the guy, right? So eventually at the end of the night, as this university student is leaving to go home, he walks past this fellow's youngest son. And the youngest son looks up to this university student and says to him, excuse me, sir, why do you wear a nose ring? And what did the university student say back to him? Why do you wear a kippah? <laughs> Same story of this week, Rebecca with a nose ring and Judah with a kippah. That's why I was reminded of it this week. So, the kid replied to him and said, the reason why I wear a yarmulke is because it means you're a or you're a fear of the king. It reminds me at all times that there is a greater power above me so that I don't become too arrogant. And then this kid, the six-year-old kid, turned back at him and said, no, you tell me, why do you wear a nose ring? Your turn. And the guy couldn't answer him. He didn't know why he's wearing a nose ring. And the story goes on that he got home and he wrote down in his journal that he was absolutely ashamed that this six-year-old kid knew why he was wearing something on his appearance, but he himself had no idea why he was doing it. He was doing it superficially, superficially. There was no reason behind it. And I think this is the same problem that we find in this week's parasha with Esau. Esau is also extremely superficial. He doesn't care about the reason for anything. He just does what he wants willy-nilly and goes on with life. He just goes with the flow. And we see that in the way that he speaks this week, because in the famous sale of the birthright, when he comes up, he says to Jacob, give me some of that red, red. It doesn't say stuff. Stuff is there as an English translation that we put in just to make the sentence make sense. But in Hebrew, he literally just says, give me some of that red, red. He uses two adjectives. No noun whatsoever. He just says, give me red, red. No noun in it. Now, in Hebrew, a noun is called Eshem Etzem, which means the name of the thing's essence. Because you've got to concentrate on the essence of life. Whereas an adjective is just a Shem Tu'am. It's a, it's a name or that explains the thing itself. Esau was extremely superficial. He didn't even care about what the food itself was. He just wanted that red red. That's all he wanted. That's all he could say. Now, Judah did this last night as well at our Shabbos table. He had two glasses. One was a red Spider-Man cup and one was a normal glass. One had juice and the one had water. At one point he said, Papa, I want the red. And I had to double check just to make sure. <laughs> just check that his hair, his arms weren't hairy and etc. etc. But yeah, Esau had this problem that he didn't see the essence of anything in this life. He only concentrated on the outer shell of this world around him. The immediate, the here and the now. He didn't look deeper or even focus to the future, uh, to the future of life itself. And this is why when the Talmud's trying to explain Esau's character, it gives us a bunch of different options that we can use to try and explain him, but it's got a very famous one that says Esau is compared to the pig, a chazer, the fark. Esau is like a pig, why? 
Because a pig, when it sits down, it sits down with its hooves out forward. And what do we know about a pig's hooves? They are split, like a kosher animal, right? So the pig sits out and says, look at me on the outside. I am kosher. But on the inside, does the pig chew the cud? No, it doesn't. So the pig is unkosher on the inside. Similarly, Esau was the same. He tried to make his appearance look like he was a good firstborn, a good boy to his father. He tricked his own father into loving him, even though he was a wicked, wicked son, who as soon as his father died, was going to go kill his brother as well, while his brother was still mourning his father's death. Esau is the epitome of what is that saying in Afrikaans? Blink on the Shining on the outside, but being filthy on the inside. And the Midrash tells us a story, uh, a fable of how, of, to explain how type of person Esau was. For example, the Midrash says that Esau got jealous of his brother Yaakov. Because Yaakov, we know, dwelled in tents, which means he was in yeshiva all day studying the Torah, right? So he was a very clever person when it came to studying the words of God. And Yaakov would ask uh, questions to his father about the Torah, for example, or something about Hashem, or something about Abraham and his encounters with Hashem. Esau got jealous, and Esau came up to his father, Isaac, and said to him, following uh, the following halachi question, he said, Father, what is the law, what is the ruling when it comes to tithing salt and tithing straw? Because last night at the Shabbos table, I was about to salt my red, red meat. And then I realized, I don't know how to count how many grains of salt there are. So I don't know what is the 20% that I have to tie. Father, what is the ruling on this? This is the question he asked his father. Right? So sounds very clever. Sounds legitimate enough, right? Let's find out some more. Let's learn some more Torah about tithing, for example. Only problem is you don't tithe on salt. Neither do you tithe on straw. Right? It's not the type of fruits and um, uh, it's not grain that you have to tithe on it. The only reason why he asked his father these halachic questions was because he wanted to appear righteous to his father so his father would buy him a new red truck for his birthday or on Christmas or try and just, you know, be in the good books of his father, which we see towards the end of his life. This is actually the case. He tricked his father. He calls Yaakov the trickster, but Esau is the true trickster who tricked his father into believing that he himself was pious. He appeared pious. And all of these charades that he did to his father to try and trick his father, Midrash tells us this is the reason why Isaac went blind. Because he was blinded to the truth. The Torah is telling us a deeper secret here. That he was blinded to the truth because of all these charades, all these fake appearances that Esau put up in front of him. Okay, now Yeshua tells us a very interesting thing because Yeshua taught us about this exact same thing. And I wouldn't be surprised if Yeshua actually knew this very Midrash that I just told you about Esau Tithing from the salt and tithing from the straw. Because in Matthew 23, verse 23, in between all the woes, right? Woe, woe, woe. He says, woe to you, Torah teachers and Pharisees, you hypocrites. For you tithe, mint, dill, and cumin, but you neglect the weightier matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faith. You should do these, but not neglect those. Those are the weightier matters of the law. It sounds exactly the same as the Midrashic story about Esau coming to tithe the salt and the straw, which is not even required by Torah, but he's missing out on the weightier matters of the Torah. Because when you're concentrated on the small minutia that's not even part of the Torah, that's an extra rabbinical thing, what happens is you miss the essence of the Torah. Your understanding is without essence. Just like you said, give me some of that red, red. And there was no noun. So too, when we do this, when we uh, major on the minor and forget about the weightier matters of the Torah, we ourselves also miss the essence of God's teaching of God's word. And when Yeshua quotes those three things, justice, mercy, and faith, he's quoting it from the book of Micah. I think it's Micah chapter six. It tells us that those three things are what this world relies upon. The Talmud's got this wonderful story where the sages are debating about the 613 commandments. They say 613, that's way too many to remember. We've only got 10 fingers. How are we supposed to remember 613 things? So they try and narrow it down. And they ask, uh, each rabbi gets his shot at narrowing it down. How can we make it easier to remember the 613 commandments? And they go down to 16 from this psalm, 15 from that psalm, uh, 10 commandments. There's 10, maybe to crack it down. We get to Micah chapter 6, and they say this is the, the 613 commandments minimized into only three, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. Uh, that that uh, discussion actually goes on to narrow it down 
in, in the end to Habakkuk chapter two, I think it is verse 14 or verse four, uh, which is uh, to walk, I think, righteously uh, walk before Hashem in uh, humility, I think it is. Anyway, but um, he quotes this one because this, I would say, just say, or the whole Torah summed up in three commandments. This is the essence of the Torah, not just the superficial foam on top of the coffee. You've got to drink the whole cappuccino because the good stuff is at the bottom. And what does Yeshua say to them after he tells them this? The justice, mercy, and faith are important. He says to them, as if he was quoting this with Parashah, you blind guides, he says to them, you blind guides, because you're straining out nets, but you end up swallowing the whole camel with its nose ring in it. They're straining out nets, but they forget about the essence, which is you shouldn't be eating a camel in the first place. So this is a lesson for us, religious individuals. When we try and put up a facade of how religious we are, we take the words of Yeshua to our hearts. Be clean on the inside as well as the outside. Clean the cup on the inside as well as on the outside. Right? And uh, we see from this week's parasha that we should, yes, we should look at our appearance and how we appear to other people. We should put up a favorable facade to people. But that facade must match our inside as well. We need to clothe ourselves with the proper clothing, right? Dress modesty, for example. Make sure you don't speak horrible words outside here in the public. But you should also clothe yourself on the inside with righteousness. Because in this week's parasha, we see Rebecca dressing her son Jacob in Esau's best outfit. So Rivka dresses him up. This is him up to impress on the outside to appear as this wonderful person. And he goes to his father Isaac, who is blind, and his father says, I smell the scent of this garment, tells us in the parasha. And then he blesses him. And then this blind man, Isaac, says the following. No longer does he smell the scent of the garment. He says, see, in Hebrew. The blind man says, see, something happened. All of a sudden, after he blessed him, his eyes were open. He says, see, the smell of my son, no longer the garment, no longer the outward appearance. This time, he says, of his best team, the smell of my son himself smells like a field that the Lord has blessed. Not just on the outside, but on the inside. And he realized that Yaakov is, in fact, deserving of the blessing. He saw spiritually more than just his son's appearance or feeling, right? He, he, he blessed him for more than just the garment that he was wearing. And this is a valuable lesson for all of us. In our religious fervor, when we start keeping the Sabbath, when we start keeping kosher, like when we start wearing kippahs, talits, tzitzits, all the regalia on the outside, even if you don't do any of these, just going outside into the world and proclaiming that you are a believer in God and a disciple of Yeshua the Messiah, you're putting up a facade. Keep that in mind. Make sure that when you do this, you know why you are doing it. You know the essence behind why we do this. Not for recognition, not so we can look cool and impress others. We are doing this because this is the weightier matters, leading us to the weightier matters of the Torah. Don't be like that, uh, that uh, university student who was asked, hey, why are you wearing that nose ring? And you have no idea why you are doing what you are doing. Be like that child who does what he does with a purpose understanding the true essence. That's more important than all these other outward things. But yes, we do still need to look after our outside, our facade that we show to people. Yeshua says, do not neglect these things. You should be doing them as well, but do not neglect the weightier matters of the Torah, justice, mercy, and faith. They are the essence of the Torah. Don't let it be said of you that you have the voice of Yaakov, but the hands of Esau. Talk the talk, but also walk the walk. And that way we can ensure that you will remain heirs to the promises and the blessings given to our forefathers. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom.